Rabbi Eric Yaffe served as president of the Union for Reform Judaism, the congregational arm of the Reform Jewish movement in North America from 1996 to 2012. The Union for Reform Judaism represents one and a half million Reform Jews in 900 synagogues across the United States and Canada. Rabbi Yaffe received his rabbinical ordination from Hebrew Union College in 1974. In 1983, he was named the Executive Director of the Association of Reform Zionists of America. In 1992, he became the Vice President of the Union for Reform Judaism, and in 1996, the President of the Union for Reform Judaism, until his retirement in 2012. This was a remote interview with Eric sitting in New Jersey and me in Jerusalem. We spoke about what does Judaism expect of a Reformed Jew? Conversions in the State of Israel, the Kotel, Chabad, American Jewish and Israeli relations, the Palestinians, and much more. I'm Barack Holman, the author of Figure It Out When You Get There, a memoir of stories about living life first and watching how everything falls into place, and a shtickel shalom, a student, his mentor, and their unconventional conversations. And this is Jewish People and Ideas, a podcast of conversations with Jewish thought leaders about contemporary Jewish topics. This episode of Jewish People and Ideas is sponsored by JerusalemEverything.com an online Jerusalem artist cooperative which sells high-quality original Jewish art in Judaica at low-cost prices, all made in Israel and shipped from Jerusalem. To learn more, go to JerusalemEverything.com. I'm a product of the Reform Movement, even though I don't look like a Reform Jew anymore. I guess that I shouldn't say that. What does a Reform Jew look like? But that's not the question. <laughs> I'm not what my mother expected me to look like. My mother is a, a very deeply committed Reformed Jew. One of the things that she said is, I have 10 talitot, <laughs> and I have all of these granddaughters, and I can't leave them to any of them. So that just shows you the family that I came from and the dilemma that my poor mother has. Okay. I'm a product of the Reform Movement, really, for the good. I grew up a religious Reformed Jew, right. which when I tell people in Israel, that I grew up religious, but I grew up reform, they're confused. It's like a paradox. Right. We didn't know anything about halacha. It wasn't a concept in our lives. Yeah. And when I told this to Natan Sharansky in our interview, he said, so what happened? I told him I went off the derech. <laughs> Even though people call it Orthodox Judaism, I call it halachic Judaism or Shuchan Aruch Judaism. Okay. So can you please explain to me what's reform Judaism? Well, we can look at reform in a variety of ways. We can look at it sociologically, we can look at it theologically. Let's let's talk about fundamental principles that apply to most reformed Jews who have a, a, a commitment to a reform tradition. There's a, a belief that Judaism is evolving, a growing, a changing tradition that has to remain within a traditional framework and yet at the same time be applied to the problems and issues of every day. There is a belief of absolute equality, absolute equality between men and women, a very, very important issue in our religious world, in many ways a, a, a central dilemma for halachic Jews and one that really is kind of, uh, you know, tearing apart the, the different factions of the, of, the, of the halachic world. For us, that's an issue uh, that is resolved. It's not that we don't have problems and we don't still deal with those problems, but it's, it's an issue that fundamentally as a matter of principle is resolved. We believe that uh, a commitment to social justice is central to, to who we are. Not only is it central, it's really the jewel in the crown. We apply the teachings of Judaism to the social and political problems of the world around us. We believe that, that uh, we, we can't be separated from the broader world and, and its issues, that this is every bit a much as much a religious obligation as all other aspects of Judaism, that we also value issues of family, issues of ritual. And we believe in boundaries. You have to have boundaries. What goes to any religious tradition that can't draw lines? At the same time, in, in Reform Judaism, 
when we draw those lines, we try and do it in such a way as to be inclusive rather than exclusive. We want gay and lesbian Jews to be part of our community, and we draw them in. We want Jews of color to be part of our community. We draw them in. We want Jews with disabilities to be part of our community. We draw them in. An inclusive Judaism is an essential dimension of who we are and of what we believe. So uh, on, on one level, that is a, a description of our uh, reality. Perhaps I would add, we work hard on creating a particular kind of partnership between our rabbis and our lay leaders. We turn to the rabbis as our teachers, and we rely on them for Jewish wisdom. At the same time, uh, we are not a Rebbe-oriented hierarchical movement in the way that you find elsewhere in the Jewish world and else elements of the Black world in particular. And we believe uh, that a partnership between uh, lay people and rabbis ultimately will produce the most vital kind of, of Judaism. That's not a, a theological statement. I'm happy to talk theology if you want to move there next. But I think that's a, a, a pretty good overview, at least in sociological terms, of what Reform Judaism is today. You wrote, Judaism is about obligation. It expects a great deal of you. As an Orthodox or Halachic or Shuchan Aruch Jew, I know what Judaism expects of me because I have the written law and the oral law and rabbis that have refined it and explained it. What does Judaism expect of a Reform Jew? All right, let's talk a little bit then about theology, which is what you're, you're mm -hmm. pointing to. As you say, I, I, I agree the appropriate terms are halakhic Judaism and then, you know, reform, which is not halakhic Judaism. So what is it? I'm going to answer here for myself, given the diversity and the pluralism within the reform uh, movement. I'm not going to profess here to speak for a million plus reform Jews, but let me answer for myself with the confidence that, that there are, are uh, others in our movement who share, at least in general terms, what I believe. Reform Judaism is a mitzvah-based Judaism. It's a mitzvah-based tradition. Now, what's a mitzvah? A mitzvah is an encounter between God and, and Jew. It's an encounter that happened at Sinai. Now, you can understand Sinai literally, or you can understand it metaphorically. Either way, God is the commander. The Jew is commanded, and particularly God's partner in this encounter at Sinai is, is Moses. And uh, the, the, the Torah is for, uh, referred to as Torah Tashem, Torah Tadonai, the, the Torah of God, and also Torah Moshe, the Torah of Moses. And when we refer to Moses, when I refer to Moses, I'm talking not only about Moses specifically, but about all of those who followed him, was either tradition from him, the prophets, the rabbis, uh, and the teachers. Now, what makes a mitzvah a mitzvah, a command? The answer is that when Moses received the tradition from God at Sinai, he felt obligated. He felt commanded by what he was given. Now, the question is, what influenced his response? And there were a variety of factors that made Moses think as he did and have this sense of, of obligation or commandment. First of all, his personal makeup, his personal characteristics, who he was as an individual, Second of all, the, the nature of the Jewish people at that particular historical moment. And third of all, the historical conditions of the period in which he lived. I mean, who we are as Jews always reflects in, in some measure what is going on in, in the larger world. So having said all of that, we realize that different Jews at different times will respond in different ways to God's command. There are times when Moses, because of who he was and who the Jewish people were and the nature of the world, when he felt commanded. But there are going to be times when looking at that same tradition, we will perhaps feel commanded, and, and then other times when we do not feel commanded. The ultimate authority for us is the individual. Martin Buber uh, said, I must distinguish in my innermost being between what is commanded of me and what is not commanded of me. So. The heart of Reform Judaism is to look upon the tradition in mitzvah terms and not halakhic terms, not in terms of a broad legal system which you must accept in its entirety, 
But in terms of individual mitzvot, which I must grapple with and ultimately must determine whether or not they obligate me. Now, having said that, as a Reformed Jew, I observe some rituals and practices, even if I do not see them as mitzvot, because they serve the function of preserving the community. And the preservation of that community is in and of itself a supreme concern of God and Torah. What's an example of a mitzvah like that? Something that you observe, even though you don't intellectually understand it, but you're observing it because it's important for the community. I have a kosher home. We're very strict in our kashrut. There's a basis for kashrut in, in the tradition. What kashrut has become over the course of time goes far beyond the basics of, of biblical law and has become an instrument to bind the Jewish people. Now, not everybody in the Reform Movement observes kashrut, to say, to say the least. Most do not, although there is partial observance among substantial segments of of the movement now. Why do I observe it in its entirety with a considerable rigor? And the answer is because I, I feel that it's something that binds me to the broader Jewish community and has value in those terms on its own. I mean, there, there are other reasons as well. It also brings sanctity to my life in a variety of ways without necessarily being because it is specifically commanded in the form in which I practice it. You want an example that I would offer as an example. So does everything go for a Reformed Jew, or are there limits as to what a Reformed Jew can or cannot do? Well, first of all, if you're a Reformed Jew and you look at the mitzvot seriously, as I have suggested, and you study and you struggle, you are going ultimately to determine that you are obligated in certain instances. Is there an element of chaos in our movement, and by uh, ultimately preserving decisions for the individual uh, to make, we run the risk, I would acknowledge, of individuals making no choices at all. So does that happen? It does. But not for serious reform Jews, and not for serious reform Jews. You immerse yourself in study. You embrace Torah, as I have suggested, you struggle with the question of when I'm commanded and when I'm not. Ultimately, you're going to end up being a Torah, a Torah observing Jew, uh, liberally, liberally understood. If Judaism for you is simply an excuse not to do anything, well, okay, that happens in the world. We're all aware of that, and there are more than a few Jews for whom that is the case. Those people are not observing uh, observant Reform Jews. How do you transmit Jewish obligation and commitment? from one generation to another, without the God-given obligation to do mitzvot and follow halacha? Well, there is a God-given obligation. <laughs> we're, ah. we're defining... Oh, this is good. This is good. We're defining okay. it differently. I talk the language of Sinai. I talk the language well, of, of, of... If if God obligated you, then how, how do you have a choice? God, uh, God obligates me, but I don't believe in blind adherence to the to the tradition in its entirety. We don't take every word as the literal, the literal expression of God's will. We don't take every word for the reasons that I said. Moses made certain decisions as an individual. He received the Torah from God, and then he had to determine when he felt obligated and when he didn't. The Jewish people at a particular moment was constituted in a particular way. It was subjected to the, the pressures of, of their uh, experience in Egypt and the escape from, from Egypt and the uncertainties that lay ahead, the difficult world in which they lived, all of those factors influenced ultimately what they determined obligated them uh, as a result of Sinai. Mm -hmm. What I'm suggesting is we go through the same process. We ultimately determine what obligates us, but we don't begin with the assumption that the entire halachic system is something that we must embrace by virtue of being a Jew. And we, we make decisions about obligation one mitzvah at a time. That's different. That's different. It's open to the possibility of chaos. And uh, it's also open to the possibility of, of ongoing creativity. And we have a sense of permanence, but also we, we understand that sense of permanence comes 
in the midst of seething change. So uh, we open ourselves to outside cultures, and we're always trying to balance the old and the new. All of that is, is part of who we are as Reformed Jews. That's not easy for a Halakhic Jew, for whom the, the, the system is clearly defined, and for whom there is often a rabbi or a rebbe who can give specific uh, um, and binding answers to every problem. That's not who we are. And if that's what you're looking for, you, you shouldn't look to us. Uh, you shouldn't look no, to us. No, I, I understand that, obviously. But the question was, and I, I'll, I'll make it clear. So my wife and I are blessed with seven children, my oldest is almost 20. The youngest is seven. Oh, he just turned eight. So I've been raising kids for a long time. And we give a lot of thought into how we're going to keep the kids involved in Judaism. On the one hand, you have to say we have limits. This you can do, this you can't do. On the other hand, if you go too far, the kid will just say, forget all this. I'm moving to Tel Aviv. I don't need this. And throw it, throw it all off. My kids understand that there is an obligation. When I say to them, for example, you can't do this on Shabbos, they understand. They understand that there's a limit. And I think that limit is what helps to, to transmit Judaism from one generation to the next. Well, I think the, the important element that I haven't spoken about really is the element of community. In other words, we're a communal people. We accepted the Torah at Sinai as a people and not as individuals. So while ultimately autonomy is a given, I mean, it's simply a given in the world in which we live. People make their own decisions. There's no earthly authority uh, that can force us to do anything. But having said that, we are part of a community, and, and we create our own communities in order to provide us with guidance and direction. And that's as true in the reform movement as it is everywhere else. And while ultimately our decisions are, are made individually, we form into communities both, first of all, in our synagogues, and then more broadly, nationally and internationally. And our rabbis come together and our lay, our lay leaders come together and we try and define for us what at this particular moment should obligate us as a community. And we set that out there so other Reformed Jews can be guided by that decision. So that happens all the time. And so the synagogue is, is the primary communi uh, community for, for most Reformed Jews. But we have a broader Reform uh, uh, community that doesn't hesitate to say, this is a mitzvah. And this is what we believe obligates you. you. You'll make your own decision. This is what we believe obligates you. That's the way it works. And those decisions as made by our, our rabbis and, and, and our ruling bodies have tremendous uh, influence on ultimately what individual reform Jews decide. Again, it's a balancing act. There is obligation. There is community. There are communal standards. And at the same time, Again, I acknowledge we are a restless, optimistic, risk-taking Judaism with a touch of chaos, and we're proud of that. We believe it makes us more creative. We believe it, it renews us and, and revives us, and we prefer it to a, what we see as a rigid and hierarchical Judaism, which is very often the kind of Judaism that we see uh, elsewhere. You've written passionately that the state of Israel should accept reform and conservative conversions. However, American Orthodox and conservative Jews don't accept reform conversions. So why should the state of Israel, which has a state-sponsored Rabbanut that is Orthodox, why should the state of Israel accept reform conversions when even in America they're not accepted? Well, the heart of the matter, we'll come to conversions, the heart of the matter is, is what you said, there's no separation between synagogue in state. That's a tragedy. That's, that's, that's uh, truly a tragedy. What we have in the state of Israel is, is a religious monopoly, and uh, then a whole bureaucracy that's built around this, this religious uh, monopoly, uh, uh, which is roughly comparable to the Catholic bureaucracy in France in the Middle Ages. But the, 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 the point here is monopolies always, always demean and destroy the religious traditions they are meant to serve. Always. So if you value Torah, you believe in the truth of Torah, why look to a humanly created government apparatus to impose it upon an often unwilling Jewish 
population, as opposed to letting it flourish in a Jewish free market. I I understand your point. I don't. I've never met a single Jew in Israel that liked the Rabbanut. But my question is, why should the state of Israel accept reform conversions? I'll add something to that. One of the things I learned about you is that you tried to get a universal standard for conversions, at least in America. I did. And it didn't work out, but I really respect you for doing that. And I think had you pulled that off and you had the agreement of Orthodox Jews in America and the state of Israel had been involved, you would have pulled off something really great for the Jewish people. But it didn't work out. Well, the... the, the um... You know the question that you're asking again. I I don't think it's really a religious question. It's it's a it's a political question. The issue is this: in the United States, as you say, we have a variety of religious groupings, sometimes referred to as denominations, but whatever. We have Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox. We have many types of Orthodoxy. We also have you know many types of non non Orthodox uh, groups. We have this this passionate pluralism. Mm-hmm. We don't accept, uh, unfortunately, in, in, in many cases, in many, <laughs> even the legitimacy of, of the other groups. And surely we, we don't accept the, the conversions, generally speaking, uh, of others. And my response to that is, well, it would be nice on many levels if we could cooperate more closely, uh, closely and find more points of, of cooperation and unity. This passionate pluralism that I have discussed is not a terrible thing. In many cases, it's a, it's a source of strength. And the fact that, that you have this, this passionate pluralism and this, this, uh, uh, diversity on, on the American Jewish scene, it's not a negative in every way. In many ways, it's, it's a positive. It makes Jewish life, uh, richer and more interesting. I, I, I don't need let me be clear. I, I don't need the Orthodox community in which, you know, whichever format we're talking about, whichever organizational framework, to accept the conversions of the Reform movement or my conversions as a Reform rabbi. If they were to do so, that would be very nice. But if they don't, they don't. And I understand and respect that decision. The question with Israel is a, is a different decision. What is Zionism about? Zionism is the, the national liberation movement of the Jewish people. And it is directed towards all Jews, not just towards some Jews. It welcomes all Jews to immerse themselves in Zionist thinking, to consider the implications of Jewish nationalism. It invites them to come to the Jewish state should they choose to live there. And whether they do or not, invites them to be part of the ongoing discussion. So whether Orthodox Jews or whether the chief rabbinate, who cares about the chief rabbinate? Well, they accept my conversion, absolutely irrelevant. Mm. But the state of Israel, which professes, which professes to speak to all Jews and to care about all Jews and to vi- invite all Jews to be part of, of the I- Israeli experience, for them to say, I don't accept you. The state of Israel isn't a religious body. The state of Israel. But the state of Israel does accept reform conversions. The state does, not the rabbinut. There's a difference. Well, well, Someone who has a reform conversion can make aliyah, correct? Not entirely. Not entirely. I mean, it, that's the way the law of return is written. In fact, attempts to change the law of return, fortunately, have been defeated. Through bureaucratic means, it is often the case that reform converts either cannot come or very often have a difficult time in coming. But within the state of Israel, reform rabbis in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv and in Haifa and in other places who perform conversions, the state of Israel does not recognize those conversions. The state of Israel does not. Right, because now you're back to the Rabbanut. Right, because the, the state of Israel says that all religious decisions that are going to be made within our borders are going to be made by the, the chief rabbis. And if the chief rabbis determine that in all aspects of religious life, within the borders of the Jewish state, Reform Jews and conservative Jews are not going to be accepted and, and embraced and considered as, as uh, legitimate. So be it. So be it. And so that, that is a, I, I don't know, how, you know, how much Israelis can appreciate how hurtful that is, how infuriating that is. I don't think they appreciate it at all. They have no idea. To, to Jews who, who care about Judaism and care about Israel. 
Those people who don't care is a, is a different story. But those of us who care and are committed, I mean, what, what the state of Israel, I mean, the state of Israel cannot say, we welcome you, we want you, be part of us. And by the way, your, your Judaism is not legitimate. They can't say, look, in our view, because this is what they're saying by accepting the, the, the Rabbinist decision, some Jews stood at Sinai. Other Jews did not. The state of Israel does not only have a, a political task, and it has a number of very important political tasks, it has to preserve the security of the, of, of the state and, and has to provide a, a, a refuge and it has to also develop Jewish culture and so on. But the state of Israel came into being also to revive Judaism, to revive Yiddishkeit. It, it came into being to do those things as well. And it, it can't simply transfer that responsibility to this narrow-minded, hypocritical, discriminatory uh, religious bureaucracy and say, I wash my hands of it, it has nothing to do with me. It, it needs to embrace them all. And we're tired of hearing about coalition politics. We're just tired of it. The truth of the matter is, is everything coalition politics? Is that what Zionism is about? In the final analysis, the narrow concerns of, of building an immediate coalition tomorrow and the next day, that takes precedence over the, the welfare of the Jewish people and how we as the Jewish state relate to Jews everywhere? Is that the, the case? The Prime Minister of Israel has two constituencies. You know, those who vote for him, and they're not all Jews, to state the obvious, you also have non-Jews, but those who vote for him, and those who don't vote for him, but nonetheless depend upon him by virtue of, of, of who he is, or who she, she is in certain cases, to be a leader of the Jewish people and to embrace Judaism in all its, its forms everywhere. That, that doesn't happen, and it's harmful, it's not consistent with Zionism, it's contrary to the, you know, the most basic goals of what the, the, the movement of Jewish national liberation was created for. Okay, so that leads us into the next question. Okay. Thanks to voices like yours, there's now an egalitarian section of the Kotel called Ezrat Yisrael, which is outside of the Kotel Plaza, before the main entrance, before security. And you've written about a single entrance to the Orthodox area of the Kotel and an egalitarian section of the Kotel. Why is a single entrance so important? I think maybe you're you're getting a, a, a little bit ahead uh, here. So le, let me let me move move back a bit. The Kotel was not the issue that I would have imagined would become as central as it did in this this conflict in the course of the last decade. It, it was an issue that was high on the priority list of the Jewish leadership of the you know the non orthodox uh, movements. And, uh, or for that, you know, whether, whether we're talking about the, the movements uh, in Israel or in the diaspora, we care very much about the Kotel, but there were other issues that we tend to see would be more important if we're going to fight the battle for religious pluralism or religious freedom in, in the Jewish state. And then all of a sudden we found ourselves immersed in this battle of the Kotel. Now, uh, I was initially, uh, reluctant. To, to enter into the battle for reasons that I've stated. I thought that there were other issues that could impact more people and would potentially be of more significance in our struggle for religious freedom. But l let me say that I, I was, was wrong in that I underestimated the importance of the Kotel to Jews throughout the world, Jews of every stripe. And they resonated to the injustices at the Kotel in a way that I would not have anticipated, but it didn't make me unhappy. In fact, that this, this, this place, which is both a, a place and a symbol, was so important to them, actually was something that pleased me. And, I mean, it's not surprising at a certain level. I mean, the, the state of Israel itself has focused on the Kotel as, as a, a central symbol of the state, and it, it used the physical location for a variety of uh, official purposes and swearing military officers and so on and so forth. Every trip you go on, and I, I've been to Israel maybe 70 times, so let's say 55 to 60 times I've gone to the Kotel. When you go on an organized trip, they take you to the Kotel, sometimes right away. It's the first, it's the first stop when you get, a, you get a, off the plane, and that's, and that's fine. And 
And when I go on my own, which is which is most of the time, I always uh, visit uh, the Kotel. So it's both a place, but it's also a symbol. And I, I didn't appreciate how central that symbol has become to Jews everywhere. What's happened with the, the Kotel? We found that the Jews... Once they could see, I mean, it's technology here that made this happen, you realize. In other words, non-Orthodox and Orthodox Jews who, who wanted to pray as women with a Torah at the women's section of the Kotel have been doing this for 30 years. The women of the wall. Nobody was really paying any attention. So why did they start paying attention? Because we have uh, cell phones and we have, uh, we have pictures and being turned away by the police. And we know something, you know. Police are an issue right now, but being turned away by, by the police, and not nicely in many instances, again and again and again, when what they wanted to do was to pray according to their own custom, to read from the Torah and so on, it all of a sudden took these events that had been happening for years and years and years and made them part of the public domain. And once that occurred, Jews in my movement and others as well said, why should we continually find that the holy sites of the old city are open to others, but not to us? And why should our souls, the souls of reformed Jews, who for 2,000 years have also longed for Zion and longed for Jerusalem, why should we be de denied the right to see Israel's holy places as our own? So that turned out to be a question of, somewhat to my surprise, but also somewhat to my delight to be a, 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 a question that resonated in the hearts of, of Reformed Jews and, and many Jews, uh, you know, throughout the diaspora. And I thought, this is, this is a good thing. This is a good thing that, that, that they have these, these deep and profound concerns. Now, the, the deal, by the way, that was struck, I didn't like the deal very much. I didn't think it was a good deal. And the place, the Southern Wall, is generally speaking, I mean, without getting into technical definitions and the, you know, the opinions of uh, archaeologists and of scholars, among most Jews, it's not even considered to be the wall. When you think of the wall, you don't think of the Southern Wall. Having said that... Well, you, you don't think of the women's section either. Most of the men's section is also not the Kotel. Just to define it, the Kotel well, was a very small space. I'm talking about in popular comprehension... When people think of the wall, the men think of the men's section, the women think of the women's section, you put them together and that constitutes the wall in the in in popular consciousness. Now, now previously the kota was this very small space. Right. And 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 it, also previously the at the beginning, war. there there were there were no partitions. There was no machitza there. You go back to pictures of the nineteen twenties when it, it uh, but that's different. That's because women were covered from head to toe. They were a walking machitza. There was nonetheless no machitza there. Because they wasn't allowed by the British. Look, I, first of all, I'm not opposed to, to uh, some standards of, of, of dress and modesty there, because you have to be appropriately respectful of, of other people. So it's not an issue of dress. But initially, there was no machitza, and Orthodox authorities ac accepted that. Okay, about that we disagree. Then we, the wall was developed after 1967. You had a men and women's section. It's the men and women's section together that most Jews considered to be the wall. And then you had this archaeological site over by the side, which is now called the Southern Wall, or whatever it's called, or Robinson's Arch. Um, Ezrat Yisrael. And, and, uh, so let me ask you, do, is that satisfactory to you? So first of all, let me say I was unhappy with it. I didn't think the deal was good enough. But... What else did you want? Look, my I wrote an article in 1996. I only went back to 2013. <laughs> right. I didn't go back far enough. In which I said... The wall in its current form, following six seven, you know, it was it was expanded. the The plaza was cleared. Plenty of room there. Have three sections. I'm not talking about the the southern wall, Robinson's Arch. Three sections: right. a men's section, a women's section, and a section for mixed prayer. What was, uh, uh, you know, what was the best? That was the best, and that's what I would have preferred. That was not. Po uh, possible. The, the leaders of, of uh, my movement, I wasn't you know, president anymore, determined uh, on a compromise that includes accepting the, the Southern Wall as the, the wall for, for you know, mixed services and or where women could pray with the, the Torah and uh, read from the Torah. They accepted that uh, on uh, certain conditions. 
And there, there were two primary conditions. And when I said to them, look, uh, is this really, is this enough? They said, look, we have two things now that we did not have before. One is previously, in order to get access to Southern Wall, you had to go around. You couldn't get through the main entrance. That's part of the reason when I say it wasn't considered a section of the wall because physically it was set up. You literally couldn't get to it by walking through the main entrance. So they were going to redo the entrance. Right. So it would be, in theory, one broad expanse. And by going through a central entrance, you could access the men's section, the women's section, and, and the mixed section. So that would at least give the impression of it being a single wall and a single holy site. And second of all, there was going to be a governing body that would oversee religious arrangements at the Southern Wall. And that was going to include representatives of the Reform and Conservative Movement, as well as representatives of the Jewish Agency and others. So those two elements made a problematic deal acceptable to them, and I I embraced their judgment there. These two things were going to happen. They were going to get a single entrance, and they were going to have a role in governments, both which would have been a recognition on the part of the state of Israel of the le legitimacy of reform and conservative concerns and actually giving them a role in a say in matters of governance, which generally speaking, as you know, does not happen. That was the heart of the deal. And it, was, it. it was negotiated for literally two to three years with top officials of the, of the government. It was negotiated in good faith. A variety of compromises were made on both sides. And then one day the prime minister said, never mind. He said, never mind. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. I've been living here for 25 years. What happened was, is, is uh, I mean, according to our sources, there was pressure from certain um, elements of the Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox community in the United States who were significant donors to the uh, Orthodox institutions in Israel. And even though Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox members of the, of the government had approved with uh, the preliminary steps that had gotten us to the compromise, they went to the prime minister when he was about to announce it and said, we, we don't approve this, so you, you have to back away. So we were outraged. We were outraged. Uh, it was it just it was a direct slap in the face. And it, it, it meant that, first of all, a deal isn't a deal. That we, we simply can't depend on the elected representatives of the, of the state of Israel to be concerned about our religious concerns, to recognize our legitimacy. We can't depend on them even to make a, a, a simple agreement and, and stick to it from one day to the next. Second of all, the prime minister made no particular effort to either be apologetic or remorseful for the years and years of work that we had put in, for what we, had see, what we saw as a betrayal. And third of all, the truth of the matter is, he could have compensated us in a half dozen different ways, in a half dozen different ways. He could have said, I deeply regret that I'm unable to do this for political reasons, but I'm going to help you out in the following ways to show that we care about Jews everywhere. And while I can't do this, I will do that. And he didn't do any of that. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Shrugged his shoulders and said, too bad. I'm sorry. Not I'm sorry. Too bad. And he walked away. So why do that? I mean, it's, it underestimates the deep commitment that, that diaspora Jews have to the state of Israel. Why is this important to us? If we don't care about the state of Israel, this doesn't matter at all. <laughs> this is insignificant. And particularly on an issue that doesn't impact our our day to day life there, but precisely because we care and our ties are are so deep, that's why this is so deeply offensive. And 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 yet that wasn't that wasn't recognized at all. It was an utterly gratuitous, unnecessary crisis, deeply offensive to people, made a profound impact. So we need to overcome that now. And you know we to do that. But uh, you know I'm deeply saddened by these. Incidents because they, as I say, they're utterly gratuitous and, and there's no, no need that we had to go down that path. What you just said leads into what I had as a later question about the relationship between the state of Israel and diaspora Jews, but now it seems relevant to bring it in. The question, I'm going to ask you the question first and then I'm going to give you the introduction to the question after, like reversing the order. The question is why should Israelis care about American Jews? But then I want to explain it. I'm in a unique position of having grown up in America. I moved here when I was, I think, 23. Now I'm 49. 
my whole adult life I've been here. And I really identify as an Israeli. When people go on and on about what's happening in America, I really feel disconnected because this is my home. And when the 2015, I think it was, Iran deal happened in the States, I personally felt betrayed by American Jewry. It felt like they weren't on our side. They were on, on the side of the deal, on the side of Obama, and this was an existential threat to us as Israelis. And Israelis in general, when I speak with them, I told many people that I was going to have a conversation with you, from Reform Jews to Haredi Jews. Everybody had an opinion about this conversation today. They basically said, here in Israel, we're connected to traditional Judaism, even if not obligated by halacha. Many Jews are connected to traditional Judaism, and reform doesn't serve their needs. So you get to this point where from the political side, Israeli Jews don't feel a connection with American Jews, and from a traditional re Jewish way, they don't feel a connection. So why should Israelis care about American Jews? Well, I mean, what you're saying is they're not Zionists anymore. So if these Jews want to throw Zionism aside and say they live in a post-Zionist era, that the notion of there being a, a single Jewish people is no longer something that speaks to them or is of concern to them. If the central premises of Zionism are irrelevant to them, well, I'm deeply saddened by that. That's not the way that I'm going to operate, but that's what I'm hearing. They're saying that, you know, Israel is for the Jews who live here, and that for Jews who are elsewhere, if I don't happen to like something that they say or do, I has nothing to do with me. That's not Zionism. That's not reality either, by the way. Look, I'm, I'm a Jew who says Jewish life cannot be sustained without Israel at its core, and Israel cannot be sustained without the Jewish people at its side. That's the heart of, of what I believe. And you're talking about Jews who are saying they don't believe that. That's a very sad thing. That's a very sad thing. So I'm going to fight against that in every way that I can, if that's ultimately what triumphs, what we're going to have is a, you know, what we'll end up is with a Jewish state where the Jews are concerned only about themselves and not with anything that happens Jewishly beyond their borders. And since the, you know, the great majority of diaspora Jews are, are not, uh, uh, Halakhic Jews or Orthodox Jews. And uh, that would be a tragedy and, and contrary to the whole thrust, not only of Zionism, but of Jewish history, as far as I'm concerned. The reasons why we should be connected and you want to talk about, okay, let's talk about that. Look. We Jews are, uh, I mean, most of all, it's a religious reason. Again, if we all stood at Sinai, who are these people to say that they don't care about me? The Jews were at Sinai, and, and, and my DNA was part of the crowd. So if they're speaking in those terms, I want them to, you know, to take a good hard look at what they're saying and what the tradition says. So that we'll start with that. Beyond that, there, you know, there are all kinds of other things. We Jews are a tiny people, a tiny people. How many Jews are there in the world? 14 million. Okay, 14 million, 14 and a half million. That is smaller than a rounding error in the Chinese census. <laughs> We're a tiny people. And the overwhelming majority of Jews are to be found today in two communities, Israel and uh, America or North, North America. It's not that we dismiss Jews elsewhere in Europe and South America and Australia. And so on, but they're, they're, it's just a fact. It's just a fact. It is a fact. So the notion that either of us could survive without the other is, in my view, an absurdity. I, I happen to believe that Israel needs us. In fact, it needs us now as never before. Uh, without us, it wouldn't have come into being. Without us, it would not be strong. It still requires our political activism. It requires our financial support. It requires our frequent visits. It requires us to answer the lies and distortions of, of Israel haters, including the self-haters in our midst, who see the rights of our group uh, except their own. And not only that, I want to suggest immodestly that Israel needs what we have to offer in America, and it needs what we Reform Jews in particular have to offer. Can you explain that? Sure. That's an important point that I've heard from many people on the podcast, that Israel needs what American Jews have learned the pluralism, the inclusiveness. I don't understand how Israelis need that. Israelis find their own way of inclusiveness and pluralism. Do they? Why do they need? Do they? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, why does the Orthodox? If you're talking about Haredim, then no. Haredim and their own planet. 
Why but does the general population? Yes. Look, why does the Orthodox establishment fear and despise us so? It's interesting. When I was, I don't do it anymore. It was a time I used to read the the Orthodox and the ultra Orthodox press in Israel uh, every day. Every day. I, well, I had a clipping service that would send me clips that made any reference to American Jewry and particularly uh, got it. An Orthodox Jewry. It was extraordinary the amount of time and energy they spent attacking us, as if somehow we were their greatest problem. Why do they? Why do they uh, fear us so? Precisely be, because of what we bring to the always percolating Israeli stew. Israel needs our experience with pluralism, with bridge building, with confronting change, with teaching respect, with sustaining religious freedom for all. And I think they have problems in all of those, those areas. We have problems of our own. I'm not saying it doesn't work both ways. We need them. But what I'm saying in that regard, we have something to offer. And at the same time, again, we need, we need Israel. Both Reform Jews and American Jews of every sort, because it's a place that inspires us and pumps the, you know, the dynamism of Jewish life through our veins. The right of the Jewish people to self-determination in its ancient homeland is one of the, the most moral and just causes of our time. We are proud in America to be making its case and speaking its name. But taken separately, American Jews and Israeli Jews are a footnote in history. But together... We're a single people, we're heirs of a great civilization, we're implicated in each other's fate and destiny. In the global world in which we live, American Israeli Jews are a single political system. We don't agree on many things. We have to deal with them together. And while disagreeing with each other is fine, distancing is not. Both ways that works. Distancing yourself for any from Israel. This is what I tell my people here. For any reason whatsoever is Jewishly unacceptable. It flies in the face of everything we know about Jewish commitment, Jewish thought, and Jewish history, but it works the other way as well. If Israel is going to be a Jewish state and a Zionist state, they can't distance themselves from Jews who are outside their borders. And if they disagree with some of our views, too bad, because we disagree with some of their views. Now, we can either talk about it or we can walk in separate directions. I pr prefer the first choice. I think you made a very important point when you mentioned post-Zionism. That's something that I, I didn't even think of living here. You wrote, and this is a quote from you, if you want to start an argument in the American Jewish community, talk about Chabad. Continuing what you wrote, you said, Chabad doesn't wait for grants, and no other Jewish movement has been able to produce a core of similarly devoted men and women prepared to serve the Jewish people with such self-sacrifice. So how does the Reform Movement deal with Chabad, who's targeting mainly the same people that come to the Reform Temples, both as members and as donors? How do you deal with a, an organization that basically has unlimited manpower and resources? First of all, when it comes to Chabad, uh, Chabad, I have expressed, as you've just said, my admiration for much of what they do. I have my disagreements with them, and I've expressed them as well. The idea that they have unlimited resources, I mean, they don't have unlimited resources, but what they do is they go into the community and they find the resource. In other words, there's there is no uh, massive multi-billion dollar fund out there, which which uh, is... Pulling. I meant manpower. I didn't mean money. But I they, meant people willing to sacrifice so much. Right. They, they have individuals who are prepared to go into communities to find resources, to build a Jewish presence built, generally speaking, on prayer and, and study. They're prepared to do that in places where in many instances, there's nobody else to do it. You know, go to places where, where there's no one else to serve. And they also bring a certain will and a willingness to serve populations that others have forgotten in, in prisons, for example, you know, where, where Jews may be located. And, and uh, you know, often there'll be a Chabad rabbi who'll go into a prison and will meet with, with Jewish prisoners and, and meet their, their religious needs. All, I find that all to be very admirable. And when I was talking about the need to aggressively reach out to Jews who were not engaged and involved, I appropriately, I thought, you know, used ba, uh, Chabad as, as an example of, of a certain kind of de devotion that we could emulate. You're talking about audacious hospitality. So that's on, on the one hand. Now, in individual communities... It varies from place to place. In other words, it depends on 
who's the local Chabad rabbi and how how he relates to uh, the rest of the Jewish community. That's a very mixed picture. There are places where Chabad uh, enters into the community. They see themselves as part of the community. They develop relations with other rabbis. They work together with the broader community and whatever its its goals may be. And there are cl- there are also cases where it doesn't work that way, where Chabad rabbis, in fact, don't establish good relations with uh, non orthodox rabbis. And you know we have instances, many instances, unfortunately, where Chabad rabbis come in and they kind of target wealthy members of Reform synagogues and they try and pull them away from those synagogues and you know involve them in. Chabad, and, and in so doing, you know, depriving support from others in order to, to, to pursue their, their own goals, how, however worthy. So, you know, I, as, as I go, as I, I don't do so, so much anymore, but when I used to travel from community to community, I would, I would find as a, a reform rabbi, I'd say, oh, I have wonderful relations with the local Chabad rabbi. And I'd find another reform rabbi, I'd say, I'm tired of, of the Chabad rabbi stealing my members because that's what's, that's what's happening. So it's it's a mixed picture. Overall, uh, their their sort of zealous commitment to reaching out to Jews and connecting them to tradition is something that I admire. The politics are more complicated. You haven't mentioned that. I didn't even know there were politics involved. Well, there are politics involved. Uh, my initial involvement with Chabad was much less positive because I was director of arts, of which was the Reform Zionist organization before I became vice president and then president of the union. And in the 80s, there was, uh, the late 80s, there was a major battle over who was the Jew legislation, which we mentioned previously. Right. And uh, the legislation as it currently stands allows any Jew, including a reform convert, to come to Israel and be accepted as, as citizens. And an effort was made to change that law so that reform converts would not be accepted and only Orthodox converts. And Chabad was a very, very significant force in Israel, working with Agudat Yisrael in order to bring this change about. And they they poured a lot of money into it. Chabad publications here, uh, I'm sorry, in in here, here I mean in Israel, Chabad publications in Israel were filled with statements, advocacy, urging their members to involve themselves uh, uh, in this issue. The Rebbe himself was very much involved. Shlemut Ha'am, Shlemut Torah, Shlemut Ha'aretz was, was the, the uh, traditional uh, slogan under which, they, under which they operated. And I was furious because, not because, look, if they want to take this position, they should take this position, but they should, be, they should take responsibility for it. And what, what happened was, in the United States, they were operating here as if they had nothing to do with this. They were totally nonpartisan and nonpolitical, and God forbid that they should should engage in, in any kind of political advocacy anywhere, or that they should take positions that would be offensive to reforming conservative Jews with whom they were working in the United States. But the reality in Israel was totally and completely different, and they were really the 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 heart, the se- the center of this effort to change the law of return. So I was the one, in my capacity as, as the, the director of Artsa, who really focused on this. I wrote about it, and I, I wrote a pamphlet called The Truth About Chabad, which simply consisted of taking quotations from Chabad publications and from statements of the Rebbe and putting them together and say, you want to know what this movement is saying about Reform Judaism and Reform converts in the state of Israel? Here it is in their words. I got a letter from Rabbi Krinsky at the time. <laughs> was not uh, wasn't a nice letter. After the the defeat of the efforts to change the law, they kind of moved away. Uh, it, it hurt them in the states. Uh, a lot of people became aware of of this very uh, fervent political uh, advocacy in Israel. They were offended by it, and the, and they they moved away from it. What, what I find interesting now is that Chabad in Israel, in the last couple of weeks, has taken. A position on uh, annexation, uh, R- Rabbi Yaroslavsky. I didn't even know that they took a position. Uh, yes, took a very strong position, and a- as did others. It's been uh, Kikar HaShabbat, which is a right, a religious website. A religious, essentially a Haredi website, has written about this. It's a place when where one goes to get news about what's happening in the Haredi world. Israel Hayom had an article just a day or two ago in which they talked about various Chabad rabbis that are organizing efforts in the state of Israel, to get Netanyahu to oppose annexation, 
because they're uh, they're opposed to you know giving up you know not an inch giving up any territory whatever i mean again it raises for me the same issues they're entitled okay. to take whatever position they want there's a big uh, debate now on these concerns and so on we need to get into that but you're you know in the world in which we live you can't expect you know, to do one thing in the United States and to do something else in Israel and assume that people aren't going to make a, a connection. If if that's your position, speak up for it, take responsibility for it, advocate for it, but but don't pretend that it's not uh, that it's not happening. So you've written a great deal about the Palestinians. What lessons did you learn from Oslo, the Oslo Agreements, and the Second Intifada? Look, the the issue for me is what what are your fundamental principles when you look at the Israeli. Palestinian conflict. I mean, I'm happy to, to answer specifics, anything you want to ask. I've certainly written about every aspect of the conflict. But the key always is what fundamentally is it that you believe and that, that, that guides your statements and your writings? As I said, I'm a Zionist. I believe in a Jewish and a democratic state. I believe the heart of Zionism is to establish a state in the land of Israel and that overwhelmingly, on both right and left, beginning with Herzl, including Jabotinsky, you know, throughout all of Zionist history, that state is seen to be a state that will be both Jewish and will be democratic. And that being the case, any aspect of this conflict, whatever the question is, I am always saying to myself, is this going to advance the cause of a, of a Jewish and democratic state? Or is it going to undermine the cause of a Jewish and democratic state? Now, I, I favor a two-state solution, not necessarily now or tomorrow, or maybe not in five years or 10 years or in 50 years. I don't know how long it's going to take. Because, you know, the security of the state is obviously its most fundamental obligation. But longer term, however long, you know, we may be talking about, I support two states because nobody else has come up with a solution that makes any sense that is going to assure that the Jewish state that I care so passionately about is going to be both Jewish and democratic. Those are the fundamentals. We already have a history now. We had the Oslo Agreements, which brought the Palestinians with authority and weapons. Yasser Arafat was brought back here like a king. And we got, what did we get? We got the Second Intifada. After Ehud Barak offered what we thought as Israelis was everything that the Palestinians could possibly want. And I was living here during the Second Intifada. Here in this office, it's on Yafo Street. I heard the bus bombings all over the center of town. I'll tell you the lesson I learned. And I came here as a liberal Democrat, and Yasser Arafat turned me into a right winger. It was Yasser Arafat that changed my views. I never voted for Bibi. I never voted him for him either because I was a left winger. And then when I became a right winger, he wasn't right enough for me. My lesson from the Intifada and Oslo is that the Palestinians will never make peace with us. So my question to you is, what are your understandings from what's happened historically trying to make peace with the Palestinians? First of all, I would characterize myself as A, a realist, and B, a sensible centrist. So I, I have no illusions about the Palestinians. Well, I believe that there are some elements of the Palestinian population that are more moderate. They have been unable to provide a, a leadership that has been, you know, willing to approach in, a, in any meaningful way what we would call a real peace. That's simply the reality. And in, in many ways, they've been just the, the most stupid and most murderous national movement in, in modern times. Again and again, they've, they've turned to terror and, and instead of to, to negotiations. And I would repeat, there are elements in the population, I think, who are more moderate than that. But you have to look to the leadership and the people who make, make the decisions. And I look at the Palestinians now, and I don't see elements there with whom we can realistically expect to arrive at, at any real peace in, in uh, certainly the short-term future and maybe even longer than that. But then the question is, Azma. Then what? So having recognized that, people on the right tend to say, well, therefore, let's keep all of the territories. Let's create a single, what is in essence a single state. Let's rule over the Palestinians forever. Let's discard democracy as a principle. They hate us. They'll never make peace with us. And so we can do whatever we want. And 
that's the only course moving forward, as if that's a good thing for us, as if that's a good thing for us. But we're not being given a choice. No, 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 no. Uh. Look, our, our job, our job is, first of all, to assure the, the, the security of the, the citizens of Israel today and tomorrow and the day after that. That's the fundamental obligation of any government. Second of all, is to keep open the option of a peace at some point in the future, however far down the road that may be, however far down the road that may be. Because if we give up on democracy, if we decide that permanent occupation is somehow the principle that will will guide the governance of the Jewish state, we're, we're hurting ourselves. I'm not here so concerned about the Palestinians. There are plenty of people who can be concerned about the Palestinians. I'm concerned about us. And I'm not interested in the Jewish state being an apartheid light state, an occupying state. I'm not concerned with any of that. Who is it that guides me? Someone like uh, Micha Goodman. I'm planning on having him on the podcast, by the way. Well, you absolutely should have him. Catch 67, Kod Shishim Vesheva. It was a bestseller for a year. Again, a bestseller for a year. What, what's the heart of his thesis? The heart of his thesis is sort of the, the messianic religious elements that say, you know, not an inch, we can't give up a single centimeter of, of the land of Israel because it's holy. That, that really is a, is a small minority position, that for the majority of Israelis, the issue is security. But he also suggests that they're not interested in being occupiers forever. They understand that there is a price to be paid and that they will be paying the price. By the way, if they have, if take direct control of a, a single state, they talk about a binational state. That's bad enough. I didn't become a Zionist in order to support a binational state. And a binational state is not going to be a binational state. It's going to be an Arab state. So he said, look, we have to be concerned about security. So that means the army isn't going anywhere. But in the interim, until the time comes, maybe tomorrow, again, maybe the next day, maybe 50 years from now, we keep open the option of an eventual peace, and we do that by separating our populations, by drawing a line and separating the Jewish population from the, from the Palestinian population. We preserve our security, and when the day comes, the Palestinians are ready then at that point, we will sit and we'll talk about a real, a true peace. And in the meantime, we will absolutely minimize our day-to-day control because we're not interested in being occupiers. That's not what Zionism is about. We're interested in that they're living their lives. We will live our lives with absolutely minimal interference. And that also means, though, what does that mean? It means you can't build a settlement every day. You can't expand the settlements every day. The notion that somehow settlement building is is irrelevant, uh, whatever. I mean, there's certain settlement blocks that are going to remain part of Israel. We all know and understand that. But if you continue to settle, you're doing away with the possibility of ever having any kind of, of Palestinian state on the other side of the border, and you're committing yourself to a single one-state reality. That is not a Zionist reality. That is not a Jewish reality. A Jewish and democratic state fundamental principles, don't forget it. Last question. Imagine you had a gigantic billboard that millions of Jews would stop for a few seconds and read the message on the billboard. What message would you put on your billboard? Two lines. There is more than one way to be Jewish. Second line. But for all of us, the place to begin is the study of Torah. So explain it to us. What does that mean? That means that Jewish diversity and pluralism, the passionate pluralism, as I've described it, of the American Jewish community and of the Jewish world in general. The truth is, there's a passionate pluralism here in in the state of Israel, even despite the chief rabbi. That's a positive value. We need to recognize it and affirm it. Let's not give the impression in any way that there is simply one narrow definition of what constitutes being Jewish and uh, being a, a religious Jew and an observant Jew. We can do that in a variety of ways. We must and we should. And Judaism is stronger to the extent that we affirm that. But whoever you are as a Jew and whatever approach you take to Jewish tradition, it needs to be rooted in Torah and we need to begin with the study of Torah. Otherwise, you're dealing with something else, which is not Judaism at all. As I've said, we don't take every every uh, word of the tradition as, as a literal, literal expression of God's will. But my central message is, though, we are built on a foundation of Torah. When I was the president of, of the Reform Movement in, in uh, North America, what I said very early on is Torah at the center. Torah at the center became what I was identified with 
as as my my central message to to reform Jews. And and the reason I think is 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 clear to to any any Jew who's connected to tradition, the central burning incandescent passion of the Jew is study, and it is Torah that binds us to a shared life, to a shared history, to a shared destiny. Judaism cannot survive the dissolution of that essence. So therefore, that has to be the message. Thank you very, very much. I'm very well. You're very welcome. Appreciate it. That was Eric Yoffe, the former president of the Union for Reform Judaism, the congregational arm of Reform Judaism in North America. I really enjoyed my conversation with Eric, and I hope you did as well. I'm working on many more guests in the future. If you enjoyed this conversation and you're enjoying this podcast, please make sure to leave a review wherever you listen to it, and to subscribe as well, and to share it with your friends. And if you haven't yet listened to the Hasidic Story Project, every week I put up a new Hasidic story. You can find that by searching for my name, Barack Holman, B-A-R-A-K-H-U-L-L, M-A-N, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also check out my books on Amazon. I have two memoirs of short stories. You can find them by searching for my name. And I look forward to our next conversation together.